Hey, Benjamin Martin here, founder of Beverly. Today, I was fortunate enough to have a meeting with Michael Tooman. I'll jump to that recording in a moment right after I introduce him. So let me share my screen. This is Michael. As you can see uh, from his website, he's not afraid to express himself. He's developed a character that is willing to add his own unique value and contribution to the world. Uh, something he's cultivated from some of the hardships which we'll go into uh, in the conversation. But in addition to his character as a value contribution is also the work he's been able to accomplish. Now he's got it all written here. You can find the link in the URL on the screen or you can use the links in the description. So in 2009, he gave this talk. Fellow citizens, let me ask you, are you really free when a webmaster controls what you can and cannot do on a website? Are you really free when Bank of America controls how you interact with your finances and Mark Zuckerberg controls how you view your friends? Now let's be clear, this is not just a conflict of ideology. This is more than a Silicon Valley ideology. So this is in 2009. And he goes on to show you a tool that uses machine learning to analyze the contents of a website to then be able to extract the actual content from the noise of the DOM and often the obfuscation of the DOM. So for instance, React makes the DOM pretty much unusable for crawling. Uh, when things like this actually identifies the content amongst all that noise, extracts it out, and allows you to actually find patterns within the data so you can actually say map the nuclear reactors in a country from this stupid uh, rendering here, or even with your bank information, be able to graph it in a way that actually shows you what you want to get. And this will work across any website. It's an integration, um, a way to integrate with any website because it finds patterns across all of them. Uh, so you're training a, a model uh, that works across. Very cool. And this seems pretty much like the foundation of modern scrapers such as Zapier or If Then Then That uh, type services. And perhaps even more in, to come uh, as well. So very cool. 2009. Very cool. Then we jump on to his resignation. He was working on his dissertation to get his PhD and he ended up resigning. He wrote this letter, which he has shared publicly. We go into that in the interview. Why did he quit? What were the challenges he faced with academia? And I go into my relations in just the workplace. Then uh, Michael moved on to uh, Bitcoin with his brother in Bitcoin mining. Very ambitious. Out of a total of 15, we haven't set up the other, uh, well, we haven't set up nine of them yet. And three of them we just have off because we don't need them at all. Over here, we have our cooling system itself for the, the racks and the pot for uh, our system. So they set up a uh, Bitcoin mining uh, operation and very ambitious, very cool, uh, very, a uh, lot of bravado in that clip. Uh, and, you know, he, he's been on the ball very early for a lot of things. So after he uh, quit university, he decided to set up his own, uh, actually inspired by what happened in the 1600s by scientist Sir Robert Boyle. Uh, he made one called the Invisible College and Michael has continued that tradition with his colleagues at the Invisible College uh, today. Uh, very similar to what we're doing here at Beverly and very much inspiring for some of the things we've actually been facing with Beverly. Uh, we'll go into that in the conversation as well. And here's the kind of the history of, you know, the, the accounting, um, the account of how Invisible College came to be. Very fascinating. And not only these things, he also tried to work on things to kind of identify uh, signals amongst the noise in conversation, find and identify on contentious issues. How can we actually find the signal uh, from all this contention and remove uh, things that add even more flames to the war and find out things that we can actually act and work on. And this is to consider it. He did this with his colleagues. Uh, and on this, uh, you can see he uh, one of its implementations is called Bitcoin Classic, and they use it to identify uh, the community's feelings on proposals. And you don't just get the 
things of everyone, you actually even can see what do the miners think about it? What do the developers think about it? What do the businesses think about it? So you get to uh, kind of ascertain things that can help facilitate a democracy even better. It's also something we're doing, uh, we kind of, with Beveri, we've uh, improved over the years with various versions of Beveri in our governance. And very cool to see these type of democratic ways in Ethereum, they use DAOs. Uh, this is kind of a way to help facilitate this. Now, not only these, he also worked on a thing called cheeseburger therapy for the Beverly audience. You're probably familiar with uh, Jordan Peterson's self-authoring. Uh, you write down your life, you find patterns, you try and identify uh, beyond your own constraints of cognitive dissonance, some patterns in your life that allow you to seek what you may desire in a long-term operation. So that's Peterson's self-authoring. This one trains uh, the everyday person in cognitive behavioral therapy. And, okay, this is the, the job posting for it. Let's go to the uh, actual website. Um, so it connects you uh, to someone who can help implement uh, cognitive behavioral therapy in your life. Um, very cool. And he finished his uh, thesis. He's called it Attention Economics. This is the paper. Uh, he worked on this with his colleagues, and this is another thing. He he collaborates. He sees into open collaboration. He works with uh, whoever seems to want to work with him, and it's so fantastic to see. Um, and we'll go into that as well in the interview. He gave a talk about it here, which is probably easier and more accessible than reading this ginormous uh, science paper if you're not into science papers or if you just want to watch the video. Uh, a little tip on this, you can right click and do download video and uh, then you can increase the speed with your native video player. So the most recent thing, the thing that got Michael on my radar is Braid. So he's doing like a new version of HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and working on uh, uh, some amendments to it to manage things like synchronizing state. Uh, so building in abilities to resolve conflicts uh, using either original transform CRDTs or and, and other algorithms such as uh, Sync9, I believe is one of the uh, proposed ones. They have some really amazing demos here. So let's jump to one of the demos. But furthermore, this breaks down the walls around websites because now you can synchronize an external website to state on an existing website as easily as linking to it. So let me show you what that looks like. I'm talking to you now through this video chat, but it's actually running over here on this other site called Talkspace. And it's just having all of its state synchronized with the demo. So you can look at all the state. So the programmer wrote Talkspace with StateBus, and now all of its state is available with a little dashboard that I brought up with a key binding. And you can see right here, there's some state called my audio, and it's showing the volume of my audio. And that's what's driving this little volume indicator. Now we can link to this state to synchronize with it in the demo page. Let's see how that works. So first, let's look at what a regular link looks like from the old web. So let's take. So that's uh, the demo, that one's on the state bus implementation of RAID. And one of his most recent projects is uh, this thing called democracy, which is kind of finally trying to uh, or implement the decentralized and private computation, computation promise of Ethereum. Uh, now, obviously, a lot of these things are being implemented all through the space by various different people. This is Michael's contribution. And I'm so fortunate to have talked to him and let's jump to that interview. Alrighty, and uh, so I saw, I wrote that whole agenda thing of anything that's uh, kind of stood out to me. Have you had a chance of going through any of it? Yeah, I've looked at a bit of it. I, I don't have, I haven't read it in detail, but I see that you, <laughs> you're digesting a lot of, a lot of the projects I've been working on. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be uh, fair to say. So we can either do this as like a uh, a conversation or as like a, a, you know, put it up on YouTube afterwards as like a little uh, 
kind of marketing piece, I guess, for you, or we can just focus on it as a conversation. I think uh, maybe doing it like just a you know one to one personal conversation would be good. If there's anything nifty out, we can take it out. But I think if we do a conversation, then from there we can probably maybe if you feel like it, schedule another thing where it is actually a formal live stream, and then we can go into uh, what we talk about if you feel like it. Otherwise, we can just use uh, this. So it depends how you want to structure this conversation to go. Do you want it to be like a big marketing piece, or do you want it? It'd be like a thing where we actually explore and, and, and learn. Oh, yeah, let's have a conversation. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff that you've put down on this list, more than we'll be able to talk about. So um, yeah. please, please guide with your interests and let's talk about everything interesting. Right. Okay, cool. So I'll give a bit of history then about Beverly. So Beverly started off uh, as a repository for my more ambitious open source work back in 2011 and my consultancy. And then, because um, I got into open source since I was a kid, and that's how I got into professional web development stuff. And then when I moved to Sydney, I started taking on bigger contracts, so then Beverly kind of housed it. But then in 2018, no, 2016, we started this philosophy study group uh, that was a weekly one with Jordan Peterson's materials and then moved on to just general philosophy. And then more recently, last year, moving on to science papers, where we read a science paper and then we... Uh, discussion on the channel but the whole goal with that uh, has kind of been to uh, scale it out um, where it's not just because it started off with just like a google document and a youtube comment and then we would collaborate in private and it's always been like how do we scale this out we're studying lectures like going through the lecture series and taking these in you know very detailed notes and then we're doing discussion groups about it how can we just scale this discussion group out and at the same time I was a place where like for most of the members, it was the first time in their lives they actually had ever talked about things that were controversial or, you know, just mm. things which they didn't really have a space to explore uh, mm. ideas safely. Uh, and we had people join uh, in the private meetings from like China, from Egypt and all sorts like around the world to discuss whatever it is. And we kind of provided that environment like this. Uh, I think Californians call it like a safe space, <laughs> like <laughs> a place where uh, people can have that intellectual freedom to talk about it. And uh, and so it's been like, how can we scale those benefits out? And I uh, get it. So one of the projects uh, we have in the pipeline is one where it's like a YouTube video, but it pulls in the transcriptions. You can jump to any part. You can search like a lectures uh, series of lectures by the transcriptions, people can add timestamp comments. So we pull in what we've already done on our discourse forum uh, into the software, and then people can schedule discussions, um, like real time discussions about it. But we want to scale that out to eventually like any YouTube video, you can have a real time chat and then discuss, you know, you let the humans do the scheduling for a real time discussion. And then uh, also have it where people can actually own their comments, own their contributions. Um, rather than it just going into that wall garden or I, I think wall jungle is a better way to be wall <laughs> jungle. To say it. Because wall <laughs> garden applies as like an Eden and the privileged of it. Yeah. Uh, when I think wall jungle is a better metaphor. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely walls in it, but I, it's a bit wild inside and there's some dangers if you're not sure what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and the system isn't really for, in your favor. It's, it's kind of... Mm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of been where it's at. And we last year, we went through John Viveki's lecture series, a 50 uh, lecture series um, called The Meaning Crisis. And we interviewed mm. Viveki afterwards and I demoed the software with him. And But always with some roadmaps, they take longer than you thought. But there's always been other issues as well with how can we actually decentralize YouTube as kind of being like a grand plan or um, how can we move towards... Mm. Um, a platform that's more about like authentic and transparent conversations where like it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. what the channel or the brand it is I can just see Michael I can follow Michael's conversations wherever they were or wherever they appeared um, mm -hmm. and you can upload your private conversations that end to end encrypted you can share little snippets make little snippets of that public that's been mm -hmm. like the grand plan and it's just trying Wonderful. to figure out the 
tech and the infrastructure to make that happen. That's how I ended up finding Braid. But then mm. I found yourself and then found what you were doing with Invisible College. And also I read through like, you know, your history, you were at university, you worked, you did that reform thing, which is really interesting, even the political nature of the speech. It's kind of <laughs> funny because the political part, like people were laughing in the audience and I'm thinking they're like, hell yeah, he's like, he's talking the right thing. Like, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and yeah. yeah, it was a bit preescient in like 2007. This, yeah. It wasn't real then. Um, and so the whole thing seemed like a joke and you know, it was presented in that way. But it was like, there's something subconsciously true to it. Mm. And now we're seeing it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. It, so then afterwards, you got into Bitcoin mining, I guess, with your brother. Mm. Yeah, yeah. He was very interested in Bitcoin mining. So I was doing that to support him. I, I love Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Right. Um, yeah. But I'm not the kind of person who likes to watch numbers go up. Mm. And that's what mining is all about. It's right. optimizing for your power consumption and your efficiency. He's really good at that. Right. Yeah. Because I, I got, I'd never understood, like, Australians aren't politically switched on, nor probably economically. We, you know, we go about and we try and live an independent life and kind of just keep our head down low and do what we need to do. Uh, and then, so I had knew about cryptocurrencies for a while. And then it was only until I saw like Roger Ver's speech where on Rubin Report, where I was like, oh, there's actually like a libertarian angle to this. Like, a, you know, you own your currency where it's not, you know, I heard discovered the whole politics of it and then i was like oh this is a thing and it kind of got me excited about it but then also before that uh you know the the money aspect is interesting but it is like a time sink like the, it draws so much attention away from other quality of life things you could be doing um, yeah it's amazing how money does how money money draws a lot of attention <laughs> away from quality of life <laughs> yeah. yeah and in in the decentralized web you know a lot of people get sucked into the cryptocurrencies but there's a whole possibility out there of ways mm. that we can connect in new ways that are underexplored at the moment you could say right yeah but it's going to be a big wave in the next few years cool so i yeah even like right now with the boom like i i learned now it's just like look I'll let the people who play that game earn all the money. I'm just going to keep selling these ideas, uh, you know, putting them out there. And if people want to send money my way, fantastic. If not, I'm, I'm going to do what I do best. And I'll let them do what they do best uh, instead, rather than everyone trying to be a trader, which isn't something they do best. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you dropped out uh, of college and you wrote a... Or at least on Invisible College, you kind of link to that, uh, your, I guess, resignation letter or your dropout letter uh, to your professor. What, what was the reason behind making that letter public? Well, when I went into the university, I thought, you know, from the outside, things look a lot better than they are on the inside mm. in, in the whole academic system. And um, I wish that I had known that. I wish I had known the, the stories of the problems that people encounter when you're let down by mm. the system not doing its job or by your professors not doing what they're there for. Mm. And so it seemed important to share that information with other people. I, I shared that first actually with the first year students in my class. Mm. So they could know what was going on. Um, and it was a very hard decision to make, especially because your relationship with your advisor is one of trying to help each other. And in academia, your goal is to look good to other people. Mm. Uh, that's what peer review is. You know, mm. it's, it's social approval. And you get ahead by having people approve of you. And um, so you, you build a culture of making each other look good. And, but there's a different story there. You know, there's, uh, and I think it's important for people to know that, but most people don't talk about it. Mm. And so, I, so I, I shared it. And that caused a lot of drama and trauma. You know, and a lot of people were upset about that. Mm. And uh, we're wondering, how, how could you say that? Um, but I put so much work in that letter in 
citing evidence. <laughs> and everything I said is true. Yeah. And I even checked it with my peers, other people working there. And they said, yeah, that's absolutely accurate. But they mm. won't go on the record saying that. Mm. And, um, but since I was leaving, I had the opportunity to not destroy my career since I was already letting go of any possibility in that career. Right. And so um, it was a, a rare situation, I think, mm. in which the incentives were lined up for me to do that. But on the other hand, I've lost a lot of friendships, you know, just because mm. the PhD was a big period of my life. And a lot of people don't want to be my friend anymore because right. I've turned on one of them. Mm. And that person has influence still over other people. Right. And so um, yeah. that's the nature of my choice. But yeah. uh, I guess I've, on the other hand, then people get to learn from that experience. And maybe that can be good for the world. We'll see. Mm. Yeah. Well, the reason why I thought it was uh, important to kind of raise is it, it was kind of unique, right? Because most people, if they are encountered that situation, um either they'll just shut up and take it or ignore it and then bad behavior continues or they'll criticize things privately rather than publicly and just for you know for what i read from it it didn't seem like anything was being uh rude or anything like that it just seemed like it was like constructive criticism and a way to defend others and hopefully for that person to rectify that that part and that face behavior, like I see that a lot, especially uh, American culture seems to have it more than, I guess, Australian culture a little bit. We generally, if someone's an asshole, we can generally say they're an asshole. Um, and, uh, you know, just in general with things. And that's actually been a hard thing for myself to actually integrate with um, American culture and everything. A lot of this face games. And here's me just saying things as it is. And some people will be like, oh, we're so glad you said that. At the same time, there's this little bit of dissociation <laughs> uh, that comes from it. But I've always kind of felt like, you know, standing up uh, and for the little people is is great. And, and uh, it, it is hard, like, you know, because whenever you do that, it's um, it's always challenging to voice criticisms publicly. But I felt the way you did so was a earnest and respectful way of doing it thank you yeah uh and that then led into your creating of invisible college and cheeseburger therapy and then your attention economics uh thesis and then to brave so it was like a big pivot but it's turned out to a lot of interesting stuff has uh come from that so what was the timeline for that? Like after the dropout, how did things kind of fall into place? Like were you all Bitcoin millionaires with your Lambos, with your brother? Or like how did, like, you know, was, or was this just like, I have no idea. I'm just betting everything. I, I don't know. Like how did the pieces fall into place here? Yeah, well, I'd say about um, one thing that you learn in graduate school, if you, if you put yourself into it, is you learn how to work for a really long time on something that doesn't exist yet. Mm. And so you don't, you're not getting any feedback of it working, of the whole right. of their vision working for years. Mm. And in trying to do that for a long time, I started to get like, okay, I can see some path with some ways to think about things in which I can work on something and have faith that it's gonna turn out in the end. And that so few people do that stuff, that if we invest ourselves in these long-term projects, we can make massive change. That's just, you know, fruit ripe for the picking, mm. but that it's hard to believe in something. Um, you have to believe in it yourself because your peers aren't going to believe in it, mm. which means that you also can't write a research paper and get peer review positively for it. You know, mm. some of the most world changing research papers were reviewed negatively at first and Bitcoin got Bitcoin itself got tons of negative feedback on the cypherpunks mailing list, what it was first announced on. Very few people believed in it. Mm. And so I was sitting in academia at the time, finding that, you know, my community was not supporting this long-term work. And I'm mm. just, okay, so I do believe in it, uh, but I am not really getting anything out of academia, even though I believe in science. But mm. at some time, like, I'm just going to have to make this stuff and mm. connect with other people who believe in it. Because some people are going to see it. You know, I think you and I are seeing a lot of the same vision that we've independently stumbled upon. And that's like 
the world telling us, yes, this is here, <laughs> you know, but we're a small sample. And in academia, you have to get a majority to vote for your papers. Right. But the greatest stuff is going to have a minority that is very passionate about. It. Mm. So I thought, well, this system is just not working. Um, so I'm going to just leave and go have to do it. And at that time, uh, so some of my colleagues, uh, uh, like Travis Crippling, we were grad students together. We were seeing the same vision and we're like, okay, let's go do this stuff. And so mm -hmm. we went out and we found this old tradition called the invisible college, which was academics from the 1600s that at that time, the university didn't, um, even have peer review. All of truth was evaluated by the church <laughs> and by yeah. authorities. And they're like, this isn't good enough. You know, we believe things that the church doesn't believe. Uh, and so they formed this invisible college and we're like, oh, I guess that's what we're doing here now too. You know, it's like, at this point, now peer review, like they invented peer review in the 1600s because they didn't have a better way of determining truth. They just came up with that. Um, and now that's taken over the academy. Yeah. And now that's become this stodgy, corrupt, like authority, slow thing that's preventing us from doing the revolutionary work. And so now we need to go back into the invisible, mm. you know, get in touch with our inner selves. Like, what do we see? And nobody else is going to see this. I'm going to have to see this myself. It's going to mm. be invisible to the world until I create it. And so since then, I've been working on this sort of long-term research agenda. Like, okay, let's change the web. You know, let's add these missing parts to the web. And let's, let's take this stuff seriously. Um, so that's been, that was my turning point. And at some point, I just let go. And that's when I dropped out. And I actually had a full draft of my dissertation already written. And, but uh, it wasn't, you know, my advisor wasn't even reading it. Mm. I'm like, okay, I have to graduate. You're not reading what I'm writing. How am I going to get you to approve of it? And so uh, I was like, well, it's going to be a lot easier for me to get this work done if I leave. Mm. And ultimately, that's what's going to matter to the world. So I have to follow what's going to matter. And uh, so I left and right. just found a new way. Yeah, it's uh, I. It's actually fairly similar uh, with my life trajectory is that my one's through business uh or entrepreneurship and mm. your one was through academia for that origin because when i started i i wanted to either be, be a game developer but then it was actually before game developer it was to be a professor at university but then my open source contributions got picked up by business uh and then it just sucked me in and i and uh, at the same time, when I was growing up, I was watching like talks by Don Norman. I saw you referenced mm. him in one of your talks as well. And I just guy. really felt like creating products, uh, like, you know, the Steve Jobs type way of, you know, doing the dent that way and social validation, not mm. through the peer review of journals, but peer review of money <laughs> mm. signaling, uh, seemed to be the way to go. But then, you know, I got a bit jaded from like the rat race in Sydney and then, kind of did the whole moneyless thing and kind of challenged what economics was by living without money for like six months and hitchhiking around Australia. Uh, and then I, that actually taught me like the importance of money. Um, and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, oh, economics isn't just a theory. It's actually like a way of explaining uh, systems and how systems evolve and become sustainable. Uh, mm. And then I also at the same time kind of was like, okay, I have a mind. I should learn how to use it. Uh, mm. And then, um, more recently uh yeah a, a few other things uh there along the trajectory but it's kind of ended up where it's like okay the academia like it at least in australia we don't i guess have that face thing as much um mm. because we have like that tall poppy syndrome where it's like you know if you stand out too much or you get too full of yourself we're going to knock you down <laughs> um so uh yeah, so to me, there wasn't really that provider of academia uh, compared to business. But then in business, it seemed a lot of face, uh, you know. So then I kind of had the same issues, especially when life experiences in my life just didn't add up with common narratives or common expectations um, and kind of ejected me out. And now it's like, okay, for, you know, generally people will watch YouTube videos or TikToks and then maybe they'll read books and then maybe it'll be like fantasy and then eventually pop and then eventually more hardcore stuff. And then I found like actually reading research papers, like if uh, the last year, hey, if I actually read the papers, I can actually these sophisticated pieces of technology stop being these inaccessible, complicated things that only, you know, the marketing department can brand it as if the founders know how to do. I can just read the papers and then be able to, you know, contribute uh, meaningfully and bring more attention to the field. 
Um, and right. through Beverly as well, it's been trying to build that community. So the tagline is building a platform and a community for accelerating collaborative wisdom. And we have like a little manifesto on our site around that. Um, Cause I just felt it was so rare. Like even with companies, it's like a battle of keeping secrets and that's right. You know, the better secrets you have, the more you win. And then open source just gets pillaged by these uh, companies. <laughs> so <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that you share a purpose in contributing to humanity's knowledge, mm. perhaps. I think yeah. that like I measure my I measure myself on how much I'm adding to our culture, how many memes I'm mm. contributing that are taken up. Um, and are making us all smarter and more powerful. Mm. And that's that's the same, that's the scholarly value, the, the internal scholarly value. But the infrastructure, the, the community that we, has evolved around that has become increasingly corrupt as it focuses more and more on getting money, more and more on peer review. There's more and more competition for professor jobs and more and more people going to school without even really caring about learning, but they're just caring about getting the prestige, getting the degree. And, um, and the, the, there's just a ton of money going into it. All of that money pressure means people are more focused on the extrinsic motivations, on mm. the status, on the achievement, and they're not looking at the intrinsic, you know, in mm. psychological terms, which it, the stuff intrinsic, that's the invisible. And mm. oftentimes when you're in school, you know, you're learning facts and stuff, but you're not necessarily learning how to learn. Mm. And oftentimes when you're trying to do something, you're, you're stopped not because of something you don't know, but maybe your own psychology is stopping you. Maybe you're mm. procrastinating. Like I think perhaps the biggest problem students are having is procrastination and anxiety and depression. And that's stuff they're not teaching you. That's all invisible. It's all subjective. It's inside your mind. And the only way for you to make progress on that is to look at your own mind and figure it out or have maybe, you know, in the past, we'd have faculty or mentors who are, they're, they're they're looking with you and talking internally and you're vulnerable and you're talking about what's going on inside. And that can't happen now because faculty are grading you and you're now adversaries with your faculty because there's so much pressure on getting the grade that you mm. have to lie to your professors and you have no incentive to tell them your problems. You want them to think you're great. Mm. And so then we're in the situation where in order to get the grade, we have to not acknowledge all of the issues that we're actually facing mm. that are the real issues holding us back from learning and the real mm. issues holding us back from succeeding in science and research. Mm. And that is all that stuff is invisible to the system. And so that's why we need to return to the invisible. This mm. is a time to return to the invisible. It sounds like Beverly is doing that too. Yeah. You guys, you, you yeah. feel to me like an invisible college. Yeah, it's well, Beverly, it, uh, I picked out the name because it means liberated in Afrikaans. I like mm. just went on Google Translate, translate. That's how I pick most of my names for open source projects. I put in a word that I want and then translate in all the different languages. I'm like, that one's that one will, is a keeper. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it, I mean, we found the difference with our open like our study group, which is like, you know, at the beginning when some people join the study group, they're like, you know, babbling, you know, uh, stumbling. Uh, was it? like uh, stammering uh, uh, idiots kind of thing, buffoons when they start. And then as they go, they turn into like forces to be reckoned with in terms of they're actually able to really argue the point, know where they stand, know what they don't know to an extent as well and be comfortable with that. And then also be comfortable with still manning the opposition. And because mm. the whole goal is like, let's, let's dance for this. And if you stumble, let me pick you up so we can have mm. a better dance here. <laughs> mm. and uh, wonderful yeah and everything you yeah. say actually parallels like the business or like everything you've had in academia is so common in business like so many times in consulting especially with the enterprises uh for instance i did one contracting job for a fairly large enterprise and uh people's identities well like the people associated their their job with the projects they were working on so if you then could say, hey, this technology could, you know, free up these 10 people from their project, save your company like a few million dollars a year. And 
and you would think that'd be met with like open arms, but instead that got squished because people like, okay, if my project's going to get deprecated, am I going to lose my job? And you would, uh, they wouldn't renew your contract if you're an external consultant, even though that's what you're hired to do to provide these outside <laughs> solutions and outside thinking. Um, yep. And even for like the kind of the cultures where even in startups, a lot of the time I realized like a lot of the job is not doing what's right for the customer or even just the commons in general is just making your boss happy and not threatening your boss's position or his feeling of control. It's like yep. you, your your ability to retain your job is often your the subjective experience of your boss. And in I, I ended up realizing like all the jobs uh, I've been incredibly successful with was when people came to me all the jobs I ended up applying for uh, I didn't really uh, jive with or didn't get employed often because they just slammed down this huge NDA in front of me and I'm like you're kidding me right I can't sign this I work in open source space (laughs) (laughs) and uh, and eventually I ended up realizing like no I'm going to uh, become a beacon uh, for people who struggled like in this intense struggle that I've had so much in my life trying to like abide by you know this little game that people are playing and then realizing no it doesn't add that much happiness I'm going to do my own thing and uh, be like a proper beacon not just like a haphazard beacon like actually be a force in the world for like you know getting this stuff sorted like you know more mission focused approach and excellent about two years ago I realized or three years ago I you know approaching 30 and I was like oh all my you know peers around my same age like who stayed in the career world, then all like lead engineers or CTOs and things like that. And here's me, a little independent contractor or whatever it is, doing my own thing. Uh, and it's hard to, you know, do that social comparison. Um, you know, that's very depressing. Uh, but I ended up finding out a better mission, which was I'm going to be the most useful 40 year old uh, that I can be. Uh, and that gave me like a 10 year direction, uh, which is that, hey, I'm just going to set my life where I'm just going to try and be the most useful person that I can over 10 years. So that allowed my decisions instead of being like short term survival based focus to instead be like, is this going to make me more useful when I'm 40? Like, is this going to be the right decision in 10 years? Uh, and that really made a lot of decisions easier. Wow. That sounds like a really powerful <laughs> thought. That's great. Um, yeah. I'm I'm turning forty, or I just turned forty, mm. and so I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm like, I uh, that would have been a good thought for me when I was thirty too. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I want to share that with others too. I think it's a wonderful idea. Mm. So you could do it for your fifty or something like that. Like I go for fifty. Instead. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. And so, all right. So or the other thing uh, here. So one of because there is some things that are like uh, kind of struggles also with this new way of doing things, right? Like with any of these new ways, it is the unknown, it is chaos. Uh, and trying to figure out which way is best is hard. And it's actually something that becomes very clear with your approach in life. It, it actually with your attention economics in that speech uh, and for Invisible College as well, even for why they founded it, which was like a, uh, they called it experimental philosophy at the time, this new science. Uh, and this idea that we can't find out truth unless we're actually running experiments. And you applied that to economics in your attention economics speech, which is like, hey, this is a lot of theory, a lot of philosophy. Let's actually do the experiments and get the results. And then we can run with this and actually get better experiments. Um, And so even with Beverly, one of the issues we have right now is I think your invisible college idea may actually be a nicer way of going about it. Because one of the issues with uh, social media uh, is it's a lot about channels, like, like inheriting from TV channels, like inheriting from brands, inheriting from, uh, you know, you are putting on a face uh, or something like that. And we're working together under, again, like another coalition. Um, and it's not really much like that kind of, because one of the issues we had with Beverly is like initially, you know, it, it served well as like a little cooperative community. Let's get people going, but it's worked best still under like a benevolent dictator model because we found like the cooperative model was a little bit slow. So we've kind of integrated the best mm-hmm. from the cooperative model in terms of like mm-hmm. uh, formal governance, like voting feedback mechanisms, uh, mm-hmm. formal moderation, 
uh, but then it's still like, okay, I can, for anything that doesn't really matter, I'm just going to be able to act on it very quickly. Um, but one of the things is when we do these large series, that's fine. Uh, but it's always been an issue now as people are starting to get bigger or trying to bring newcomers on board. Like, do we do it under the Bevery brand or do we do it under the personal brand? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, because if either way, it's like a sacrifice. Um, mm -hmm. And because you're still in this tit for tat mode. Whereas it seems reading that history page about invisible colleges, they've inherently designed it as a way to make the individual strong where the invisible college is completely invisible. It's like a mm -hmm. little association they have, but it's not a, a place or a channel or a pub. Because can you imagine how silly it would be if we do say, even for like this conversation or like in real life conversations where, you know, before we have any conversation, we first have to, this, you know, decide on the venue we're going to have the conversation before we can have the conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's where um, I think this modern attention economics uh, side of it, more than just the meaning of your paper, maybe that's part of the paper. I haven't actually read the paper. I watched the talk um, that you did. Um, it's is probably where, Good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that uh, it, it's, I called it, um, there's a term parasocial media where it's like, you know, a one to many to one type of relationship um, where people kind of develop a faux relationship or a faux mm. friendship with these stars like PewDiePie. I watched him. We were going mm. through like kind of similar struggles uh, in 2016 or so. But then over time, mm. he just started playing Minecraft a lot more. I'm like, I'm not his target audience, even though I felt there was a connection here. And I realized mm. it was completely like a faux friendship uh, and he doesn't actually know who I am. And none of this, it's similar to pornography. It's like a faux relationship or faux mm. courtship or faux mating. Um, mm. So, but there's a lot of uh, factors in this attention economy, which is trying to make it where you're, you're just like a click farm or, you know, you're getting manipulated into these cultivated manufactured brands. And I think, at least with Bevery or with our projects, one of them notably being Fountain is, it should be a situation where it's like, you know, you have a conversation, doesn't matter where you had, but that conversation is yours and, and you can follow people's profiles and see the conversations anywhere, providing they made it public. And you have ownership over the privacy of those conversations. Because that would eliminate like a lot of this tit for tat uh, issues we're kind of having and trying to operate or revise this new version of Bevery which is if we just eliminate the idea of the Beverly channel altogether and just made it like a collective or a group and then have the conversations wherever people are, because with a person like, like uh, at least for me, it was a big learning from the book, uh, the man who wouldn't stand up the separation between a person myself and my persona, which is how other people inter interact with me. Um, and that separation actually allowed me to figure out how to pick my battles. Because if I just care about like 100% integrity where I am my persona, uh, then I have to defend every single little attack at me, even if they're minute to maintain my integrity. But if I'm like, okay, this is my persona outside uh, and I have my own integrity, then I can have a public persona that I cultivate accordingly to my own mission and it can pick its battles, uh, you know, so I won't engage with, you know, anonymous trolls on Twitter, or I'll do bigger goals and things like that, even though they're challenging me. Um, but it's a little thing. That, that's like the one thing I manufacture about my existence is public appearance to an extent. And it allows me to have like all this personal, you know, neuroticism or anxieties, but not broadcast that to the world, I can still maintain this interface between myself and Michael uh, here, right? I still keep things secret from you. Uh, so there's still like a persona that is occurring. Um, and that actually allows myself to actually regain more agency and control in my operation. I don't have to be like, okay, I need to tweet every single thought I have. I need to broadcast my anxieties to the world. Instead, I can separate that, have agency and be like the captain of my ship and navigate it to where I need to go without everything uh, being public or robbed from me and i and that ties into this idea here with this learning which is like your person is the one thing you hopefully will always have control over even if you're being tortured or you know oppressed in certain jails and certain horrific stories that i've been fascinating with fascinated with um mm -hmm. 
you know, they end up maintaining this uh, stoicism with themselves, which is like, you can never get in my mind. I will mm-hmm. always have ownership of my mind. Um, mm-hmm. And that's something which I think is lacking in this, or the attention economy is trying to make us forget. Mm. And I've quit, wrote a little document called like Quit the Perverse, where I'm like, you don't need a smartphone. You don't need an app. You don't need a new computer. Mm. You can get shit done uh, today without always having to buy the next thing or believing you need it. Um, like you mm-hmm. don't need a Kindle to read books. If you can't afford a Kindle, you can just, you know, maybe you don't even need the book. Maybe you just need to, uh, you know, cultivate your yourself a little bit better. But just trying to get people to think like you don't need Instagram mm-hmm. to share photos with friends. You can call the friend up and then share the photo of a live stream or you can just mm. meet them and discuss it and actually develop like real reactions with the people rather than just uh gesticulations of emotion yeah mm-hmm. yeah well that's this is really fascinating i think that you're getting at uh some some very core topics in mm. how we live with each other through the internet yeah. and and these are things that i think we're, we're all swimming in especially between there's the self this individual who who are you Okay, and the invisible college is very focused on you. Okay, we're, we're, let's make the rest of the, everything invisible, or the rest of the college make that invisible, and then you yourself focus on what's invisible within you, and learn how to trust yourself and believe yourself. And if you're in tune with yourself and you're in integrity with yourself, then when you're on Twitter, you might feel like, okay, I'm just going to say exactly what I believe. Mm. And that was also the phase that I was in when I was leaving graduate school. I was focusing on what I believed and what I knew. And that's why I put that letter out there about like dark things or sad things about my experience, because it was true. I saw that and I just had faith that being in integrity with myself will be in integrity with the world and things will be better that way. Um, But that was kind of, and that was a reaction, I think, to the group, because you've got self, then you've got group, and then you've got others. And the group is, that's how I was in the university, maybe how you are in your job or when you're working for a brand and if you're trying to work for Bevery as a brand and grow Bevery or some project that's spinning out of Bevery you know then you've got this group element and like okay well what's going to be good for the group and how do I behave according to these group norms but then you've got a third um, entity here which is the audience the other the Mm. one that's perceiving you or perceiving this group and if we're stuck in one of these things you know we can lose ourselves. Mm. Or we can lose track of the group and the group is necessary because the group binds us together. Bevery, like you cannot be an invisible scientist without having your scientific community to talk to. Mm. You need that community and you have to care for that community and grow it. But then the last one is the other, um, you know, and, and the audience. And when you are the fan on the other side of PewDiePie, having your experience, you have a relationship with PewDiePie. You feel it. And when we are ourselves or we are others, we are giving that to them too. And by focusing on that, you know, focusing on the other's experience of us, it actually also gives us freedom because we realize I can be in integrity with myself without telling you everything. But I can, I need to also simultaneously care for this group. Mm. And I need to ultimately care for the audiences and their story that they're telling with me. Mm. You know, I, because they don't have access to all of my internal thoughts. Mm. So I can't just be me. I can't just be the raw, you know, unfiltered, uncensored. I'm going to tell you everything about me because they're not going to be able to fill in the details. I have to look at what they're getting and empathize with them. And so you have empathy at three levels. You empathize with yourself. You empathize with your group. You empathize with your audience. And all three of you have stories. And those Mm. stories need to be intact. Mm. Very, uh, Fantastic. <laughs> I, I, very, uh, very good. Very good bounce back from what I said. Uh, um, alrighty. Uh, so we, we have two minutes left. Uh, I, so I have a bunch of links that I, those were like the main points. I think the, the cheeseburger uh, thing, I'm not sure how much you know about Jordan Peterson. Um, yeah, he's, <laughs> He's he's been involved in the circle of cheeseburger internally as well. Okay, all right, cool. Because uh, yeah, he had his um his whole self authoring suite, which seems mm. to mm-hmm. they protest similar goals in terms of mm. you do it, you write it out, and you get mm. these tremendous benefits. 
Um, so that seems nifty there. For Braid, I read through the papers, things like that, and I posted in the group. It seems really nifty. I'm going to continue researching it. Um, and there's nothing we can cover in that short time. Uh, the attention uh, economics, one of the things I think is interesting is maybe what you're... One of the things that I was confused about is whether or not it's uh, your... Because you said you're trying... You think there's a flaw in economics itself. And I left some notes uh, in there that maybe that was a little bit too ambitious of a statement, or at least from my own thoughts. But also for what you're measuring, it seems maybe like a better way is to call it distraction economics. There's a book um, that I shared, uh, a few ones. One is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And another one mm. is by Cal, Nor Cal, Norport, Cal Newport's uh, books called Deep Work and Digital Minimalism. Uh, but mm. this other one, Indistractable, they talk about how uh, your goal is to have traction in your life and you need to avoid distractions. Um, mm. And, you know, for one of the things you're measuring, I wonder about that if, because uh, you talked about for the economics, it's like this internal force um, where it's like this unlimited supply of attention. But if we consider uh, our attention over our lifespan or our attention over our uh you know, lineage uh, of of the species, then it is somewhat more eternal, and it gets more into this evolutionary uh, aspect, this mimetic evolution uh, or cultural evolution as well. Um, in which case, then maybe these immediate things, uh, maybe it's being it immediate could be actually measuring distractions away from something more eternal or more of this immediate focus, and how that would rectify then with long term. Uh, uh, focuses and directions of attention I think is like an interesting question to explore. Oh, uh, beautiful. Explore some more. Yeah. Well, that sounds wonderful. And it sounds like a, a really interesting spiritual question <laughs> when you're asking, like, how do I focus my mind on that yeah. which will last forever, on that which is eternal, mm. you know, and, and ultimately, I think when people go down that path, they're, they're looking for God. They're looking mm. for uh, whatever word you want to use there, yeah. the eternal, you know, the everything. And you mm. want to be connected the ultimate to rule maker. Mm. Yeah, it, that's like a more Peterson and Vivek uh, way. John Vivek is also worth uh, looking into. If you've checked out Peterson, he's got a series called Meaning Crisis. Um, a lot of it is, I, I, yeah, I have some notes in there. Maybe at some point you can check it out. Thanks so much for your time, Michael. I really appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Ben. This is great. Um, and good work in you know the last... <laughs> 10 years of your life or whatever has led to where yeah. you are right now. Yeah. Um, it's uh, inspiring to see you. I, I see that beacon and I mm. hope I can feel your fire anywhere. Uh, I'm yeah. able to in the future. I'm going to be keeping an eye out. All right. Thanks so much, uh, Michael. Uh, en enjoy your, enjoy your day and, and, and your life, everything. You're, you're really inspiring. You really are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Goodbye. And that was the interview with Michael. You can find all the links in the description below and learn more about Bevery in the description below. We're trying to build a platform and community to accelerate collaborative wisdom. And we've been doing that for a few, several years now, inheriting from a long history of our open source work. And yeah, check out our other videos and, uh, and help participate in this and help further this all along. Uh, thanks so much again, Michael. Really great talking with you.